It's 9.30 um, and we will start the meeting, so I'll ask Councillor Galloway to give us a cow cue, please. Are you going to put another one too? Yeah, we're going to put another one. Hang on, and two, two, two big, big, big tanks. Yeah, so that's just a filler in there. So we have uh, no apologies today. We have uh, James Goff and Catherine Chu are joining us by Zoom. Welcome, guys. Um, some, can someone help me keep an eye on that and if they can put their hand up, thanks. Uh, are there any declarations of interest? And um, item three, confirmation of previous minutes. Do I have a mover for those? Melanie seconded Jimmy. All those in favour say aye. 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 Opposed, it's carried. And this morning we have a one public forum. We have um, Kit Doldney from the Avon Heathcote Estuary East Tai Trust. He's going to speak to us via Zoom, of course, on the um, the drone usage over the estuary. So, welcome, Kit. Kia ora. Kia ora. You're on. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks everyone. Uh, as an estuary trust, we're um, concerned about drone use over the estuary and are requesting that consideration be um, that because of the conditions for the use of drones is limited to um, 50 metres or 100 metres of birds, I understand, in the current regulations, uh, as the estuary is a huge wetland with thousands of birds, we actually request that the whole of the estuary be an exclusion zone for drones based on all sorts of information about bird disturbance and the damage that, it, that drones can do to the feeding habitats of our birds that uh, live and uh, feed in the estuary. So uh, we've done quite a bit of work, my colleague Anne Kennedy on this, and uh, we've made a submission and uh, that's our main thrust of what we want to detail today. Are there any questions? Right, well, is that the end of your presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just we request that um, drones be excluded from the whole of the estuary. So, so we're not the authority that controls that. I mean, we can control where they're launched from, apparently. Um, have you um, also presented to Environment Canterbury Regional Council? Yeah. Yep, you have. And apparently um, the uh, Ministry of Transport is undergoing policy changes now and they'll have um, the second stage of that out for consultation next year. Are you aware of that? I think Anne's on top of that, yes. Yeah. Um, can I get Libby to perhaps come to the table and talk to that for a second? You've got a question? Mike. Thank you. Just wondering what um, Environment Canterbury said to you when you presented to them. Oh, good question. Uh, I'd have to refer to Anne Kennedy for that, um, Councillor. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I think they'd generally be supportive of um, our concerns. What they, uh, I'm guessing that, but um, I'd have to get back to Anne about their actual response. Okay, so, so if you could actually just let us know, Kit, by email, that would be great, what that response was. Yeah. And um, sure. I'm just wondering if, if we were to um, submit in stage two to request that the estuary become an exclusion zone, would we have to consult prior to doing that? Um, it would be separate because the, the second phase of the Ministry of Transport's consultation will be the drone rules, and so that would be part of the civil aviation rules, and that's a lot of that to do with safety and um that's also um, aligns with the Wildlife Act things, and so and so you can't disturb the birds anyway. So the way that we have managed the estuary so far is a permission required area, just like the um, the ones listed in the policy at the moment. Yeah. And so every time a request comes into council, um, it's sent to the park asset managers from that area, and also um, Andrew Crossland um, looks at these requests as well, just because of the. Um, 
the concerns with wildlife and the time that the requests that do come in are generally declined, um, where it could be anticipated that bird roosting sites around the shoreline and on the sandbanks um, could be disturbed. Um, the times when it is approved has been when there's um, work such as shoreline erosion mapping, vegetation and weed mapping, asset condition inspection, inspections and things like that, and the um, timing for the drone operations carefully managed to, um, for the stages of the tide, the time of the day and the time of the year to minimise the impacts of bird life. And um, most flights of that nature have been um, occurred under supervision of the council's regional park staff. So where drones have been permitted, drone operations have been permitted, it's been managed quite um, quite carefully by the park staff. And what's so. the reason most people give for wanting to launch a drone? Is it to take photos or...? Um, it depends. Um, I'm not sure exactly about the ones that come in for the estuary, but it does sound like from um, what the park staff said that they are for surveying purposes, and so there will be pictures and things involved around right. that. Um, Can I just add something? Yes, I could, yeah. I uh, just wanted to say that um, that's, yes, we're totally behind that kind of mapping, and general organisations are very good at asking permission to fly their drones, but what we're talking about is anecdotal ev evidence from our members and our community that people are flying drones without asking. So um, we yeah. need to be able to sort of um, yeah. flag these events. Yeah, and, that, and that's the hard one because it's a very hard one to, to enforce. Yeah. Um, it is one, if people are seeing drones that are um, being operated and flown around areas where they shouldn't be or where they're causing disturbance in, um, to the wildlife, that's also breaching um, potentially the Wildlife Act and um, other legislation like that. And so that is something that um, the police could be contacted or Civil Aviation Authority. And the Civil Aviation Authority is the regulator of the drone's rules. And so if, the, um, if someone is operating a drone without landowner permission, in this instance, either the council or Environment Canterbury, um, then they're breaching the, drone, the um, Civil Aviation rules as well. Um, so if the Civil Aviation Authority gets more evidence that people are operating in these areas, they might be more inclined to have people out there um, issuing infringements because they have the authority to do that, whereas the council does not. Right, so it's a tricky one. It is, yeah. But um, thanks, Kit, your five minutes is up, but thanks for raising our awareness on this, and I think that we will... Um, it, it has been noted for the next time that the policy is reviewed once the new drone rules come in, so we'll be looking at all of these things in yes. the next 18 months or so. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. So, will you keep this committee informed on the progress of that? Yes, that'd be great. Thank you, Kit. Thanks so much, everyone, for um, listening, and thanks for your good work. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Cheers. Okay. Right. So, there's no deputations today, no petitions. So that takes us to items seven, eight, and nine, which are the minutes from the Banks Peninsula, Christchurch, West Melton. Um, uh, zone committee reports. So um, I have a mover for those. Mike, seconder, Mel, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Opposed, that's carried. And now we come to item 10, which is the biodiversity fund criteria alteration. Have we got any staff here for this? We may not need them. So, pardon? Mike Davidson's moved that already. So this is just to increase the, um, you notice that we have this year um, increased the Biodiversity Fund Council from 200,000 to 400,000, um, which is a really good thing. It was uh, requested by the community loud and clear. Um, this is to increase the ceiling per, per property from 40,000 to 60,000 so that larger projects can occur. <laughs> I kill. And also to extend the period from one year to two years for fencing and five years to planting. So that gives people more time to deliver it. Um, the, the fund is going really well. It's always been oversubscribed. And it's, um, it's a great thing because it involves partnership. It involves community stepping up and increases awareness of the biodiversity outcomes. Um, Kelvin, would you like to say anything more on this? Uh, no, it's what you've explained it very well, and it's an excellent fund, and I think it's producing very good results. We've had over 44, um, around 44 successful applications, and basically this is just an efficiency thing to try and make um, it easier to get large applications through in one year, in one year rather than two or three. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Are there any questions? No questions. 
All right, it's been moved. Do we have a seconder? Or oh, Andrew? So, any discussion? No? Nope. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Opposed? That's carried. Thanks, right. Calvin. Thank you very much. And now we have the um, item 11, the resource recovery report that we skipped over last month because we didn't have our meeting. And, oh, is Ross? Ross will be on his way. Ross is on his way. So this is, I think this is a really good report. It's, um, it's, it's really interesting. It points out everything that we're doing to minimise our, our waste um, and also the way that we are getting out, the team's getting out into the public and get, really getting the message out there. So um, I think the data is showing that the yellow bin contamination is continuing to, to fall, which is saving us a lot of money, and um, people's uh, awareness is growing daily. It's fantastic. So um, anyone we'll to wait for um, Ross, I think, before we've got any questions. One thing I did hear on the... Um, radio this morning was the amount of fly tipping that's happening in Auckland and costing a lot of money and apparently we don't have that data so I think we should look into being able to collect <coughs> that data somehow because it's going to be relevant with the increase in the levies we may see more tipping and so we need to know if that's a knock-on effect so we're going to have to um, do something there. Yeah. 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 Are you an ideas man? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I like it. I do like it. Okay. Helen, we're going to switch to your report. Some bright spark round the table thought it might be a good idea, and I agree. <laughs> so tell Ross not to worry. Oh. Oh. What to do now? Oh. Ross. You go. Such a good idea, actually. <laughs> 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 yeah. found an Sorry, Ross, we didn't know how far away you were, so we were going to go to the next report. But welcome. Uh, apologies, I was, thought I was on the end of the agenda. But so we, 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 we're on fire this morning, so it's not your fault. So, um, do you, have you got an introduction to your report? We were just saying how good it is. Uh, thank you. Um, look, um, Actually, I'm just working on this, the current report for uh, presentation in November. Um, look, probably some of the, the key points um, in the report is that we are making uh, good headway in terms of the contamination and the recycling, um, and uh, that, is, that is even improving uh, since this report, uh, which is encouraging. Uh, there's been some good initiatives. We've had some top 10 tips that we've put out uh, to further assist people in, in getting that right. Uh, we are looking at moving into uh, the malls and supermarkets to have face-to-face -face interaction with people because we understand that some, some residents are, uh, we're not getting to with the normal forms of communication. Um, and we're also, uh, we have just initiated something in our own building to assist with our own staff with a, a competition in between the floors to make sure that we are getting it right so we can actually be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Mm. Um, the closed landfills, uh, just a bit of an update with that, uh, Bexley, we have um, actually started the work at Bexley last week. I do have some photos if anyone's interested um, as an update. Um, uh, a Nuku uh, landfill. Uh, we met with uh, ECAN and the local Renanga over there on the 20th of September uh, just to look at progressing that. They do want to use that uh, site for Waitangi Day um, celebrations uh, using the, the top part as a car park. Um, they are unveiling a PO and some adjacent bit of land uh, uh, on, on Waitangi Day. So we have worked with ECAN to make sure that we can at least have the car park uh, provision uh, uh, done for, for, that, um, for that ceremony. Uh, the Le Bons Bay 
landfill. Uh, we have scheduled to start that work next week after school holidays. So that is the removal of that landfill um, with probably the majority of the material going to Cape Valley. However, we are having a uh, transitional um, uh, location where we're going to assess what can be recovered out of that landfill. Uh, so it may be things like the metals, uh, it may be things like um, some of the material that might be classed as uh, clean fill that we can actually put into a, a different uh, uh, type of landfill which won't incur the same cost that we would as uh, shipping all that to, to Cape Valley. Um, yeah, that's prob probably the main things going back to June, July. Mm, good. So Mike, you've got a question? Thanks Ross. Just a question on the Bexley landfill. Um, and it says in the report that the initial works are to clear the areas where birds are likely to nest for prior to the nesting season. Yes. Hasn't the nesting season started? Like yep. I thought it was September to February. Yes, yeah, so what we did, we actually had someone working through through, through lockdown to, to check and see what uh, um, nesting sites, if any, had been established by any uh, species. And uh, there was only one that uh, could have been removed, and that was uh, the only one that was there. And that, that allowed us to commence those, those works as per schedule. Uh, we have a similar situation with Le Bonds. We are checking this week before we start the, the, the works next week to make sure there's nothing being nesting there in the interim. Okay. Ross. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of education whether there's an opportunity with the rubbish tins at the parks in terms of you know perhaps some notification for people to, what they could take home and what you know so to kind of extend that education is there an opportunity for that? Absolutely we'd be happy to work we, we don't look after that directly so but we'd be happy to work with parks and, and transport as well for the for the streets. Um, I think any uh, type of education, that's the feedback we, we get back and even with what we're doing within this own building, the feedback we're getting from our own staff saying I didn't know that or you know, querying certain aspects of what we're doing, um, a lot of it's just a misunderstanding and uh, you know, if we, the more education we can get out there, so yeah, we'd be happy to look at that. Yes, as we noticed that uh, Eco Central are running really good programs getting out into the community Yes. To, to schools. Um, I know the St Albans Community Centre had them there for their AGM for the Residents Association a couple of months ago. And that's really good, really good thing to do. So um, yep. they're also, by the way, they're also running a, a recycling uh, project in their foyer where they've got bins for uh, wine bottle screw tops, uh, beer tab, terror things, bread labels. Yes. And uh, toothpaste and toothbrushes, yeah, which is really cool because all that would go straight to landfill normally, wouldn't it? Right, and, and, and there are schemes around for that, and it's really creating that awareness that these these, these schemes are, are around. And, and my team are working and closely with um, Eco Central and, and doing joint presentations out in the community to certain groups. So uh, it's really getting that consistency of those those messages yeah. about what can be done and what can be diverted. Yeah. Phil, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Ross. Down at the and um, down at the Burwood length, uh, Burwood, the, the old one. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a ask a question asked for me from the residents' association. There's a hell of a lot of, that has been finished, and it all looks good, no problem. But they're just wondering if they can actually use some of that because it, out of say 100 percent, 70 percent is finished, and 30 percent we're still working on. But the whole 100 percent is still fenced off, mm. and I know there's a uh, residents meetings sort of coming up that the there, going to? There, there is and we, we're, what we were hoping to achieve was to have some of the residents go down to Burwood just to see what, what we have done. Yeah. Um, we are trying to get as much open as we can um, but it's really just um, that there is works going on in, in a lot of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, all the work and uh, around the ponds, I'm not sure if it was in this report or not, there should be some photos. Yeah, they're good. Um, they're really all nice those have it. to be fenced off. Um, all the ponds have got to be fenced yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, for, for health and safety reasons. So we can't actually open that up. Um, so, so we're fencing off ponds, but the next yeah. thing you know, we'll be fencing off the Avon River, do you think? Um, no, I'm being facetious. <laughs> um, so, and we also, uh, as you're aware too, the, the sensor material at Site B, uh, we, we are 
um, wanting to have a uh, just a, a ceremony there, a blessing there for that material, and that will be early next year that that we're we're planning, and and then it's handed over to Parks, sort of mid to 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 the, the third quarter next year where it will be yeah. opened up. It's because Trans Waste have exited there yeah. have, have we okay thank yeah, you absolutely that's that's all finished so so. it's just it's just people were seeing it how good it looks and they just want to know when they could actually use it yeah absolutely and there's still a lot of planting uh the, the other thing health and safety wise is just ensuring that we're still with the the landfill gas the wells there that the well heads are nice and secure mm-hmm. and we're just we've designed something because they have to be ventilated as well because we can't have gas build up in, in there as well so it's just like a, Thank you. It's like sleepers that are built up. So where does that gas go? I get a bit confused with the gas. So some one. of it comes to here, some of the wastewater treatment plants so it's uh, basically the, 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 the gas is, is drawn out and we have a, a like a, a treatment plant uh, at, at um, Burwood and then it's distributed through the through the um, the gas lines through the wastewater treatment plant here, um, the art gallery. Yeah. Uh, because I thought that that was running out soon, but this report says it's been steady. Yep, yep. So what's the life left in that, do you know? Uh, it's, it's a bit of a guess that the landfill is quite old. Um, we are putting, uh, we have been putting new wells down and getting good results uh, from the new wells, uh, um, uh, good production out of those wells, but understanding that uh, th- there is a limited life to to the landfill gas. That's why we're looking in other areas um, for other sources, and we're talking about anaerobic digestion for uh, the organics, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. as another source of potential energy because we know it will run out at, at some point. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, it's, it's 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 it is meeting our needs, but we know that it will diminish over time. Right, and um, oh, Yanni, um, th- thank you. F- for your report and just wanted to um, thank you for doing the fly, the kind of fly tipping um, campaign in Phillipstown, like working with the local residents. I, I think when councils looked at the past around addressing that sort of issue, um, I think a community based um, approach working with council staff is really can be really productive. So it'd be interesting to see how it goes. But, yeah, thank um, you. I just wanted to acknowledge that because I thought it was really cool that we're doing that. Um, I just, the, the, the plans really kind of the key document in this report, but it's actually because of the way it's presented on our computers, it's quite hard to, right. just yeah. really hard to get your, your, your head around. Um, so in particular, I mean, I had several questions relating to it. One is, I'm just trying to understand how the um, new collection systems for inner city recycling is, is going, like how are we tracking in that regard around, um, obviously we had a lot of deputations through the long-term plan. Are we on track? Um, when are, when are we likely to get a report and then be in a position to introduce the new scheme? Okay, so, so the, the, the stage we're at with that at the moment is we uh, we, we did a presentation to elected members probably about uh, a month ago now, um, and we are working through the uh, with the bylaw changes, um, and um, we will be doing presentations through to the community boards and then out for consultation on, at the end of this year. So that is to um, look at uh, the the areas that we'll be collecting in because we're looking at extending the curbside collection. There's some streets around the central city that we can actually do the standard curbside system. Um, there's areas in Banks Peninsula where we can <laughs> include in that as well. So it's all part of that that, right. that whole program, including the differential charging that has been able to um, uh, allow people to the flexibility of the bin sizes and uh, choose those and, and pay less or more accordingly. So, so is that work going to be done in time to inform our draft annual plan changes so that yes. we can make any sort of budget changes required that's the as plan. part of signing off on our draft annual plan? Yes, that's the plan, yes. Okay, and do we, so we don't need to be putting budget 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 bids in for that, staff will just account, account for that. We, we've spoken to, to, to finance and uh, uh, rates around the, that, that mechanism. Okay. Um, the idea, of course, it is going to be cost neutral in a sense that, uh, you know, we, we've got to understand that if we uh, allow people to opt out of the system, that we need to recover that money somewhere else. Yeah, the second question I had, or item um, questions on the second item, was the plastics, um, 
So I'm just trying to work through. The, the funding we got from central government, um, yeah, that's the problem with the spreadsheet. If I, if I enlarge it to, to read it, then I miss the um, thing. But basically, um, the, the $16.5 million grant that we got to ECL for enhancing sorting of recyclables at MRF, um, it looks like the design should is just starting and it'll be finished by March 22 and we're going to build in April. Are, are you able to give us any kind of update on how we're checking on that particular project and what work's going on around the types of materials? Yeah, sure. What, what we've actually done is we've asked Eco Central to present at the next this next meeting in November oh, okay, cool. um, to provide an update because uh, yeah, I, I think they've gone through that procurement phase and uh, um, are now looking at um, uh, into the build build phase now. So um, yeah, just uh, they'll provide an update in November. Are there, do you, do you, is it likely that there'll be? Like, is it going to be quite prescriptive in that they have to go a certain way, or is it going to be that there's options around the level of investment that if we added a little bit more, we might we might be able to do more, or you know, um, different technologies? I I don't kind of know, but. I guess I'm just interested if there'll be a decision point for us as a council or whether Ecocentral will simply make, make the decision. Yeah, no, look, that's a really good question because that's something we've been concerned about from our perspective. Uh, the, the money from central government has been very prescriptive and it can only be used for the optical sorters for, for plastics and fibre, which is, which is paper. Uh, we have been requesting that there be an additional... Um, uh, pre-sort at the front of their operation so that if there were um, truckloads of material that were coming in uh, which may have been over the 10% threshold that there was the opportunity to, to pull that um, contamination out so that can still be accepted so we're still working with, with EcoCentral on that it seems that uh, there, there is going to be a, a restriction on space so um, in, in the short term it may not be something that's uh, uh, that can be included in this, but it's certainly something we keep asking them that we need to, to, to have as, as a consideration in there. Okay, just just because in the past we, we signed up to, obviously we, we were the ones that made the decision around what got put in in terms of the MRF, um, but for this particular case, EcoCentral is the one that's going to make that that call. That's correct, and we've been we've been asking to, to, to have that information as to, but we haven't been included in, in the decisions. Maybe, as what maybe type of equipment to, that, that they've chosen or, or who the, the provider is. I mean, it's quite significant for us because you know they'll do what's in the best interest of the company, but we've actually got to look at what's in the best interest of our strategy and also of our um, costs. So, yeah, I just just glad that um, that's been flagged, and maybe we can think about a way to. Um, look at that. Um, and I just think so. You can ask more questions. Uh, well, it won't be till December, will it? That they'll come. I think November is what what because because um, I think it's actually waste next next meeting. Oh, it is. You're right. We're, we're just so hijacking this meeting. It's yeah. just because okay, ask those questions. Yeah, yeah, but if you look at the time frame, like if they're starting the design now, you need to get in early. I mean, listen I, to what listen I, to what Ross has just told us. Um, like you know, we do need to. I think look at this. I think we've missed that opportunity in the sense that the, they've ordered, the, they've, they've d designed it, the, they've ordered the equipment. Oh, okay. Um, but we were asking them right through um, yep. for that for that input as to, okay. to what was going on. But surely yeah. the funding would have conditions attached to it that it has to be a best practice model anyway. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and like I say, it was very prescriptive as yeah. to what they could do with that money and it was specific to the optical sorters. Um, what we provided to um, uh, um, Eco Central was the same business case that Auckland Council had put for the, to the ministry for their funding. So we provided that to Eco Central, and, it was, and that was what that, that was based on. It was that that technology that could be used to to uh, and because the money came through the provincial growth fund. Um, it was very specific about being for plastics and they were able to add on about the fibre as well for, for separation of that, but, but it wasn't able to be used, as I said, for a pre-sort area or anything like that. Which is a real shame because that'll cost us a lot of money in the long run. Hmm. Um, just um, two other quick questions. One is the whole issue of glass recycling. Where, where have we got to or where are we up to with that? 
Sorry, did you say glass? Se- yeah, glass, separate, separate glass yep, recycling. Yep. So that's forming part of our, our service delivery review. I just got a draft of that uh, last night. So um, that, that'll that form part of that as to a, a big a big um, contingency there is what the central government is going to do with their container return scheme. Uh, that will significantly impact the amount of material that we receive in our uh, recycling, the yellow bin. Okay, thanks. Um, and just finally, um, just... The, the bylaw review and the clean fill um, bylaw, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the actual title, but I mean, the bylaw reviews, will, will that include um, existing disposal sites? Like, I'm just mindful that there's one that's got a whole bunch of e waste, um, metal, um, uh, waste recovery. Um, I, I mean, I was on one of those hearings a wee while ago and I just wondered whether we're doing anything around um, the establishment of dumps, basically, in the city. Obviously, we've asked for some advice through the district plan process, but I wondered if there was any connection to the bylaw review that would look at um, just putting some, I guess, requirements on if people are going to run rubbish dumps and, and huge, massive recovery operations, you know, having some restrictions or controls on the activity. Yeah, so so part there's two parts to the the bylaw review, and uh, one is with the the, the, the curbside collection and the wheelie bins. The other side is the, the waste handling licences that that we will be issuing. Um, we we currently do that. Um, we only have a handful of those, so that there's not a huge um, uh, number of, of independent operators who who are handling waste. But yes, we have our, our criteria, and we will be assessing that on an, an annual basis. Uh, that, yeah, look, I, look, I can make sure that we include that for, for the next tweet. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure exactly where, where that opportunity is to, to feed into that, so I'll, I'll find out and um, make, you, make yeah. you aware. Thanks, Yoni. Cool. And then Aaron. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ross. Um, with the new 16 mil thing, MRF we're putting in, there must be a time where nothing's happening what, what are we doing with all the recycling that's coming in we're we taking it to Cape Valley or we stop filing it uh, no look the, the uh, Eco Central have assured me that they are able to, to continue to operate oh, okay. um, they've scheduled it as as such in terms of the the various components and um, they will need to stockpile for a period of time um, but that material will get processed and uh, yeah the, 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 we're not we're not going to be diverting anything to land Good. thank you if it doesn't smell. Aaron. Yeah, um, just got a couple of random questions. Um, on the resource recovery, uh, sorry, the Burwood Resource Recovery Park, in the photos there, it looks like we're still using the plastic plant wraps, are we? Why? Because uh, I saw another photo yeah. further up where someone's using cardboard. Mainly because we didn't have to pay for them. We, we're reusing them. They're, they're old ones and we're just reusing them. Um, there but was when that. you get a bad weather event, you lose a few. And Burwood's quite close to the ocean. Good good point. Um, yeah, it's, it's we, we were... Uh, BRRP had been using them, wanting to charge us for new ones. But we, we've said, look, we'll use the, the old ones. Um, uh, what I can do is ensure that you know after a wet event like we've just had over the last few days that we have someone go and actually look and see if there are any that are lying around that need to be picked up. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, good consideration. Yeah, you're even there's probably volunteer groups that are happy to do it to get it before it ends up in the ocean. Yeah. Um, is with that in mind, I mean, should we be looking at moving away from the plastic, even though there'll be a, a cost to it? Well, I would have thought recycled cardboard's cheaper than recycled plastic, but I'm not a scientist. Yeah, but they have to be sleeves. I mean, you can make recycled cardboard yourself in your garage, try doing plastic. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could have a look at that. Yeah, yeah, a good point. It's actually not a very good look for us either, should we continue to use plastic? Yeah, and I'll make sure that someone is, you know, just checking to make sure we aren't actually. There is a distance between um, Burwood and the sea, but this, you know, obviously one can carry it, so we'll just make sure there's a clean up uh, if required. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you know, 130k an hour winds and picking a relatively quick trip, but 
um, that aside, um, then do we, when we're doing a resource recovery, do we ever put a, um, a resource versus recovery lens on it? As in the cost of getting a product to something to say it's been recycled or reused or something versus it's just not worth it, we need to find another way? Yeah, I think if you, you if you look at a, um, a, a number of um, items that are recycled, that um, there, there is a significant cost to that, and that is part of the work that we are that the new campaign we are doing before we go for the for the consultation on the um, the flexibility in the bin size is actually for people to understand there is a cost to recycle um, because of the some of the the um, Example: the, the plastics. You know that there is uh, um, the, the costs of collection and processing, and then separating out and, and to, to, to what to whatever market. So, uh, look, we are always looking at the viability of whether mm. that's that's worthwhile, and then that comes back to working with central government and and reducing those um, materials that are not practical to, to recycle. It's, it's uneconomic. Mm. So, so is, is recycle the right word to be using? Because traditionally, originally, recycling made economic sense. People reused stuff in the system because it was economically viable and it made sense. Like you took in your old newspapers, schools collected them, they made money, glass, so on and so forth. Somehow we've moved away from that and now it there's a whole lot of other stuff involved which makes it uneconomic, which for me alarm bells should be going off because I don't know how we move from that model to where we've got to. Yeah, a lot of it is driven by the commodity prices and um, you know that's, there's a history there with uh, Meta New Zealand and, and Eco Central when the commodity prices drop that the whole viability of the, uh, the operation um, becomes more and more difficult. Uh, so, so yeah, there there is a direct correlation between um, what what is a uh, commodity worth in terms of recycling it and and, and turning that into to, to new new product, um, as to um, you, you know having having other products which could be reused um, over and over, and this is part of the container return scheme as well as looking at refillables, for example, rather than actually. Um, Recycling materials. Can we we use the old glass bottles and just refill those? Um, so, so there is that work going on that looks at the economics of um, what is viable, um, because a lot of a lot of um, businesses that are you know green and doing the right thing, if they're not supported financially, then they don't work. So you know that's so then they're not sustainable. Exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, then the Next one is someone recently posted, and some councillors would have seen it on Facebook, <coughs> a piece of metal that got rejected from the recycle bin. It was steel. So I think it was an offcut of rebar or whatever. They're like, oh, this is a piece of steel. Metal's recyclable. We do it down at the dump, put it in the yellow bin, gets rejected. Why? Yeah, and that's a hard one for people to understand. That the reason is that the plant can't process all that material. So metal is <coughs> excuse me, recyclable. But you put a, a bit of Rio in there and it's going to punch it through a, 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 a conveyor or a screen so it can't be acceptable as a um, something that can be recycled. So are we, are we not using a magnet? Yeah, but, but it's before it gets to that. It's, it's, it's got to go, it gets all pushed on to a conveyor which goes through right. a metering wheel and up through and when we have people hand sorting, pulling things out. Um, and that, that is really difficult to educate people that, you know, yes, okay, that is recyclable, but no, it's not something that we accept in the recycling bin yeah. because it, it's a, um automated uh, separating plant which 25 tonnes an hour, you get something that's that's in there that's going to jam everything up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's difficult to, to educate people, but that's the reason. Yeah, okay, so that's cool. Um, and it, that makes sense, just drop it to the... One of the yeah, other ones. and people yeah. get money for that if you know. Yeah, and then um, finally on Yanni's point around the glass, um, we're still not recycling glass. Why not? And why have we not looked to solve the problem? Like the last fifteen years, um, uh, designer glass tiles, recycled glass tiles have been incredibly popular. We could have opened a plant and made glass. Like, why do we not solve the problem? We just keep going. Oh, the commodity market's not working, but. 
that'll always happen. Why not just solve the problem ourselves? Yeah, and, and I think there's probably opportunity for, for um, glass uh, proper um, uh, a facility like they have up in Auckland for um, basically it goes there, it gets melted down and created into to new glass products bottles. Um, there's I think there's still a percentage of the population that think that happens. They don't yeah. realise it gets dumped. They actually think by putting it in the bin they're recycling. Yeah, and, and part of that is the, is, is the collection method by having co-mingled and having it mixed in, um, that the, the, the contamination of that glass through the, the MIRF process is that that's all it really can be used for is, is, is going into, into roading. So then you'd be looking at the <laughs> separated collection um, and when I say there's opportunity for that, there's, there's twice as much glass in, in New Zealand in the system um, then can be processed up in uh, by Visi up in Auckland. So, and some of the restrictive issues so there. But why are, not a South Island plant? Yeah, because I was going to say transport costs. So if you've got something local, um, okay. Can, can we get a? Can, the can we get bringing in their container return scheme? So can we get a, a like a paper or something on can there be a South Island plant? Obviously, it would be in Christchurch because it's the centre and half the population. But can we actually well, see the numbers on it to? Like, if it can't work, it's just out of the question financially, then we'll keep dumping glass. But if there's some sort of way it can be done, yeah, we shouldn't the keep asking the question the year after year. We're bringing in this container return scheme, which is yeah. probably going it will to... Only apply, but once again, it, it's greenwashing. It'll, have, uh, it'll apply, you take your thing back and get 10 cents and stuff, but it doesn't get recycled. No, that's the money. The, the yeah, they'll collect a whole lot of money and not recycle. The glass won't get the so hang on, yeah. I'll let Ross... It, 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 yeah, yeah you, you're right, but... It then becomes the ownership of the glass. So whoever's after they've got their refund owns that glass. Then there's their opportunity to have that that business. So council may not need to. But be that's involved. a false economy, though. That's not it, that's not sustainable. It's not standing on its own two feet because the glass has a value. It's charge people more, so make products more expensive to get to the same point. Yeah. So so the consumer will pay. Additional for to cover that that to achieve refund. nothing. So well, but you don't. Well, that's why I would like to see a paper come in that if there's twice as much glass in New Zealand than what Auckland can handle and Auckland can recycle it, what does a South Island plant look like to solve the problem locally? And that doesn't have the, also the distance and actually solves the problem. Doesn't greenwash it with a charge per vessel, which makes no sense. So, and it'll come down to who owns that glass once it's been. Uh, you know, once it's been paid for, and there, whoever it is, whether it's, it's eco, it goes to Eco Central or wherever, there's that business opportunity. Council may not need to be in, in, involved directly in in um, certain aspects of recycling and waste with with the um, CRS, but also with some of the um, stewardship schemes. They'll be taken care of by the manufacturer or by the distributor. Um, and, and, and to me, that's that's a better way of doing it because at the moment we're just picking up whatever anyone wants to manufacture, and that that's your plastics, you know, yeah. um, so, freeze so, forward. So to be clear, does the Auckland plant currently have a subsidy? Does that lose money? I I don't know how that that. How's it the, not the point? If, oh, if sorry. You, if you if you're talking the uh, the, the busy plant, yep. that, that's all in with similar to what we would have. Auckland Council pay busy uh, processing fee for all the re the curbside recycling, and glass forms part of that. And they just smash it up, don't they? No, they turn it back into glass. It's the, actually recycled. Really? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, it goes through a, a, another beneficiation plant, is what they call it, to, to get out the contamination, um, and, and then that goes to, to Vizzy for um, processing into to new bottles. So I guess what Aaron's asking is, is it, would it be viable to have a plant like that in the South Island? Do you have any data that you could send us a memo back? We're not necessarily asking for a council to run a scheme, but would, it be, would the South Island have enough product to make a plant like that viable here, yeah, and look, from from what I know, that the the, um, the cost of setting up a plant um, is, is in the sort of hundreds of millions sort of range. So um, whether that's scalable and you can actually get a, a, a plant that's, you know, we can look at the the ballpark numbers around that. 
But again, it's going to come down to who owns that glass. Now, if the CRE scheme doesn't come into, into play and, it's, and it stays the same with um, Eco Central, then, then, then there may be an opportunity there um, for us to be involved or Eco Central to be involved in that. Um, but I, I believe it's. Is there anything you could flick us out in a memo just out Yeah, look, I, I can do some That's sort great. of ballpark and yeah. Yep. Yep. So Leanne's got a couple of questions then, Phil. I just it was just a random one because I was just following um, Aaron's lead. But the handheld battery recycling program, um, that's going well. Yeah. Um, but there aren't enough places, you know, that you could. Why can't we just have some bins downstairs <laughs> so uh, that mm. people can use them? And at, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just that I mean, there's hundreds of people that work in this building or come into this building every day. Um, it just seems to me that we, we want, want to make it easy for people. Mm. Um, every single venue is somewhere you have to get into a car to go to. There's nothing walkable. Yep. Yeah. At, at this at this stage, it, it is it's a good idea. We'd, we'd love, we do have something on the full floor, but not everyone knows about that. Uh, but um, <laughs> but it does come down to a cost and the co collection cost associated. So we do have funding for this latest round, which we've got through uh, MFE, um, ECAN and Canary Waste Joint Committee. Um, and those that money has been spent on spreading the scheme out through Canterbury. So because it was our initiative in Christchurch, we got the, the first around money with the seven receptacles that we had in, in uh, around Christchurch. Um, so it really just comes down to the, the, the money side of it for us to actually be able to have the receptacle and the, uh, the the servicing for picking that up. How much do receptacles cost? Uh, a couple of grand, yeah. But the servicing may be, uh, you know, you might be looking uh, probably three or four thousand dollars a year. Yeah, compared to anyway, but um, but but anyway, uh, that was my random, and um, I just wanted to say thank you for answering a question I've had about on the tips to bin good. Um, so I've often wondered whether you take the the um, sellotape off the cardboard boxes before you put them in the yellow bin, and it says you don't have to, but thank you if you do. Yeah. So yeah. really appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. It's all good. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, that's good. Hey, um, Phil's got one last question. We'll have to make that the last because we've run okay. out of time. Um, just, just put everyone in the picture. Ro Ross is correct with the problem with um, our glass that's co-mingled. Mm. And Eco Central would be happy to not do glass because it wears out the machine. It's a pain in the neck. Following Aaron's uh, observation, we, we don't recycle glass. We just dump give it. It. We dump it in a road which we crush it and dump it in the road. Um, Tasman, the only way to do this is to do separate glass collection, and Christchurch is the only city in the South Island that doesn't do it a lot. Tasman all goes straight up to Busy. They've got a separate collection thing. They collect the glass separately in colours, and it goes. Ours is commingled and messy. Uh, all the rest of the stuff comes to a place in Christchurch which play around with it, and collect it clean and then send it up to Busy as well. But we've got to look a lot differently at the way we're doing it. We've, we've, we've got to just change what we're doing. The containerous turn scheme, in my view, is a bit of a smokescreen because it's stopping us taking the plunge to go to either one way or the other. If the government would actually say we're doing it or we're not, it would give some clarity on where we're going to land. So. That's and we were expecting that um, announcement at the Wasemans Conference in November, um, so th then we'll know have a direction from government. Yep. Great. If you could let us know, that would be good. All right, and I said one last question about the fly tipping. Apparently we're not collecting any data on that. Is there any way that we can? Um, we obviously contracted out of Yeah, yeah, look, uh, once again, um, we, we we ask for that data too from from transport and and parks and it seems to be in with mixed up with other parts of the contract so it is it's hard to get the best information I've got is that it's around about 1.2 million and it's, it's split evenly 600k between parks and transport is the cost of that fly tipping 
Um, and, and look, and as Yanni mentioned, we are looking at um, uh, being targeted in specific areas where we know it's problematic and, and working with communities to address that. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks, Ross. Good thank report. You. Apologies for my lateness again. That's right. Oh, you were just in time. Um, all right, Helen, your report, please. Writing 12. All right, thank you. Now, I realise oh, we... Sorry, hang on now. Sorry. I've got to move. We accept that um, Ross's report. Second. Right, second. Um, Leanne, thank you. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. aye so it's carried. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just on timing, I do have um, Brian Norton here to give you an overview of the stormwater yep. and how we look after stormwater, and I wonder if we should do that first yeah. Yeah, and give him nice. the opportunity. Yep. I'm keeping an eye on that for now. Yep, thank you. Yeah, you can operate that and I'll get out of your way. Welcome, Brian. Kira, thank you. What have you got for us? Something <laughs> really exciting? It's on the hub. Um, luckily, there's no dramas to present or questions that need uh, decisions. It's just um, sort of a... FYI of, of where we're at and some of the things that um, that we talked about uh, when we caught up, um, which was really about just expressing um, sort of our concerns around preserving uh, the council's unique approach to surface water management in the city um, in light of Three Waters reform. Uh, since then, you know, there's been a, a fairly clear um, message uh, about Three Waters reform, but um, nonetheless, you uh, thought it might be useful for me to kind of talk about some of the founding philosophies um, of surface, surface water management and the trajectory that um, the council's been on with yeah. um, delivery of that kind of infrastructure. Yes, with our exemplary projects. Yeah. Um, this is a very detailed um, flow chart, which you all have probably seen at some point, which talks about the planning and delivery framework for um, surface water infrastructure and how the regulatory authorities and our consents and our community partnerships all sort of fit together. Um, the kind of area that I want to look at is um, mostly related to uh, the integrated water strategy and also um, some of the catchment vision and values documents that the council's had in place for, for quite some time since um, sort of late 90s, early 2000s, and how those um, are being implemented through the uh, stormwater management plans that uh, we're developing um, for the city. Um, I think everyone is acutely aware of why we manage urbanized stormwater. It's to you know improve surface and groundwater quality and to manage flooding, um, but perhaps not how the council um, likes to do that. And um, you know the council has a unique strategy for how it implements st stormwater infrastructure when compared to other councils in other parts of the world. And there are some guiding principles um, that we are able to sort of um, stand by that, that came from early documents, including um, one which is quite old now, but which is very interesting. It's the 99 Waterways and Wetlands Natural Asset Management Strategy. Um, and from that, we've generated a Waterways and Wetlands Drainage Guide, um, which uh, carries a lot of those principles into design. Um, and all of that originated from the 2009 surface water strategy, which is now the integrated water strategy. Some of the fundamental um, principles of those documents are using collective and integrated stormwater management. And um, it's not just an efficient use of land and also more cost effective to maintain, but it creates um, uh, larger spaces that can be that can be used for green space in in neighborhoods and oftentimes for new developments it's well in excess of of the park areas that are generated for those neighborhoods um, this bottom bit is a is a quote out of the natural asset management strategy and it just says 
the sustainable management of the natural and physical resources that make up Christchurch's system of waterways and wetlands can be expressed simply in two ways, working with nature rather than against her and managing the system for all its values. Um, oops. So just for some examples, and some of you have probably been out to see some of these facilities, and these are large integrated stormwater facilities that are, a lot of them are, um, were built in, in the Southwest area. And there were um, a scheme to both manage the, the growth but also provide um, a flood protection and retrofit stormwater treatment for large areas of existing development in the Southwest. This is Sparks Road wetland um, on the corner of Henderson's Road and Sparks Road. It's 17 hectares in size. Um, it's in what's kind of known as Henderson's Basin, so it does uh, a natural ponding area, but um, it's uh, you know, got 90,000 wetland plants uh, 1.7 kilometers of walking tracks, and it involves 600 meters of um, restoration of Henderson's drain. So we turned it from a box and drain sort of um, drainage board legacy kind of design to in back into a more natural waterway. Uh, another example uh, of of a massive. Um, multi-value stormwater system that's been ongoing for several years and it has a few more years to go but um, they're going well out there as Eastman wetlands um, this is uh, the bulk of Henderson's Basin which is being redeveloped into a series of wetlands and storage areas um, and we'll also have planted forest um, massive areas of uh, green space and um, walking tracks as well and will eventually involve about a kilometer and a half a restoration of Kashmir Stream to take it from a very much a agricultural sort of um, degraded state to more of a natural uh, shaded um, waterway. We've just finished last year a uh, 12 hectare stormwater facility at Quaifs Road, um, which is going to um, service uh, that large area of, of Hallswell um, development. It's called Quaves Cox's Basins. Not the best name, but potentially be renamed. <laughs> um, and it it puts 12 hectares of green space in the middle of a, of a future urban area, uh, 1.5 k's of walking tracks, and 240 meters of um, Quaves Road drain restoration, which is a spring-fed waterway that is degraded over the years, but has um, lots of potential. Uh, not everything that we're doing is confined to Southwest area. This is um, a lovely wetland that's been constructed just south of QE2, um, next to Phil Potts Road, um, called Buller's Wetlands. And it it's, has four hectares of green space area, um, a kilometer or so of walking tracks around the outside. And it involved a restoration of about 400 meters of Buller's stream, which was um, a, another box line drain, which has a, a lovely base flow of, of groundwater in it. I don't know how well you can see this. This is sort of a map of the Southwest area. And this was really the first stormwater management plan that we put together sort of back in 2009, 2010. And um, I, I just wanted to kind of go through um, the progress that we've made in this area, sort of in those last 10 to 12 years. Um, all of the little blue bits are facilities um, that are multi-value green space and, and stormwater. Um, Green ones are completed facilities. Uh, yellow stars are under construction at the moment. And then blue uh, basically are in design or um, are hopefully gonna start shortly. Um, you can see those popping up. So that's um, Hallswell Junction Basin and Wigram um, Wet Pond. Those have been in for many years since the late 90s. Uh, Wigram was recently expanded to include um, a wetland area and an enhanced storage area as part of the Upper Heathcote storage program. Um, so if you haven't been out there in a few years, it's worth a look. Um, that's Awatia 
um, basins. Uh, that was a, a sort of a collaboration between Natahu and, and the council to create stormwater soakage basins um, right along Awatia Road, which service part of Wigram Skies, but also a huge area of existing development upstream. Uh, really lovely green space there. Um, that's the Wigram Skies basins themselves, those two, and also the enhancement of Paparoa Stream that runs between kind of the Wigram Skies residential area and the Hayton Industrial Park. So it adds a nice buffer between those two uses. Um, further on, we've got, um, I'm having trouble seeing that. Um, there we go, Douglas Clifford and Bishop's Green Basins, um, Aiden Field, North and South. Um, if you drive along Hallswell Road, you can see um, a bit of green space there, um, right at the edge of Aiden Field's later stages. Um, Kirkwood North and South basins. Uh, we've got some basins in the Hallswell domain called Lower Milnes. Um, there's Cars Road basins, which are uh, large infiltration basins um, sitting in between the motorway and where um, Fletcher's has built some um, uh, affordable housing. Longhurst and Quaife's Murphy's Wetland, um, which were part of the sort of part of the um, Fulton Hogan Longhurst development, uh, Nightstream Park, so on and so forth. So these are all finished. Um, that's one is Sparks Road Basin. So that's associated with Hallswell Commons and or what used to be called Meadowlands, and it's still under construction. Um, we're building the other half of sort of the Sutherland's system, which is Hoon Hay Basin. Um, uh, Kashmir Worsley's Valley, so that's under construction at the moment. Um, the plan is to put a, a flood retention dam in there, which you may be as aware of as well. Um, that's Eastman Wetlands, which is still sort of underway and has a few functional um, facilities, but still lots to do there. Uh, Rossendale Dams, which are under construction at the moment, that's an infrastructure agreement between us and, um, and uh, Rossendale um, uh, Brent Rostron. Um, Calder Stewart, there's basins being built in the uh, industrial area up there. Those are largely developer driven. And then uh, the ones we have on the books to come are Green Stream, which is in design at the moment. Um, and we're talking with the residents out there about that. Um, there's great opportunity for a green space through there uh, in conjunction with uh, Green Stream restoration. Um, and then Later will be um, some sort of facility related to Nottingham Stream, which we hope to provide not just for the new development in that area, but also um, some retrofit treatment for the Nottingham neighborhood. There's in the so, sticks, so much, Brian. Yeah, we're just going to have to move it along a bit quicker. Yep. So, yeah. Um, sticks area. Uh, very br briefly, um, we're about forty percent through here. Preston's is complete. We've got basins. Um, completed at um, High Field and High Stead, and also Spring Grove. Um, and then there's there's obviously some more under construction at the moment, um, Blakes Road wetland and so on. And uh, there's ones in design at the moment, Gardner's Road um, and so on. So that, that program has been going since about 2014 and it's about 40% complete. Um, there are still some big ones left to go. Next up will be sort of Avon uh, area. And um, while we don't have a huge program there, we do have some, some very large and um, uh, substantial projects, including a treatment system for Rickerton and Addington streams, which are quite um, dirty, uh, commercial areas and large residential areas and so on. And that'll be a facility that's located in Hagley Park. Um, it potentially could include a diversion to the wastewater system if there's capacity. So we're investigating that. Um, Waikakariki Horseshoe Lake wetland, which design is underway. And then there'll be lots of facilities that we have planned coming through in the red zone because there's um, some great opportunity to, to utilize natural low areas along um, the Avon River corridor. Beyond the Avon River um, stormwater management plan, we'll have Lower Heathcote 
and Hallswell, which you probably have seen draft um, stormwater management plans coming through for those areas. Coastal and estuary will be next, followed by Otukakino and then Banks Peninsula. And then looking forward um, will be uh, a, lo a lot of those areas um, are existing developed. And so you'll see less large integrated systems simply because there's no space um, to do them. We'll be focusing on things like source control, um, small scale mitigation and, um, uh, and planting, especially in the hills. And then if we do end up with future growth areas um, after a revision of the regional policy statement or um, so on and so forth, then you'll see probably a return to large integrated um, stormwater facilities. Any oh, questions? Well, that was amazing. Thank you. I mean, this shows you the complexity of our stormwater management program and our flood management pro program is just massive. And a lot of these, um, they've been in the design phase for many years and they'll be in the delivery phase for many years. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how any transition into a different entity would, would work with all this work and also with all our community involvement in some of these as well. Um, look, maybe one, oh, we've got a lot of, we're really running out of time, guys. Um, only if you've got a really important question. I'll go Anne and then Phil and Yanni. Really Otherwise important. we can fire them through. Really important. Since most of this is happening out um, my way, um, I want to thank you, Brian, for the really great email that you sent to the residents up Kennedy's Bosch. Okay. I think it was really, I circulated it through. But um, um, in terms of understanding what's happening out there, would it be possible for you to do a briefing to a combined community board, um, Kishpe Sprade and, and Horswell? Yeah, I think that that's um, the best thing to do at this yeah. stage. Um, we did do a, a bit of a presentation to the uh, Kennedy's Bush yes. Road Neighbourhood Association. It didn't seem like it was enough information to really give them a lot of comfort. Um, so yeah, I think it would be uh, worthwhile to widen out that um, that message a bit. Yeah, especially now that we're just in we're in that concept design stage still. So yeah, yeah. so it, particularly what you've just presented today would be fantastic. I okay. think yeah, really great. Mm -hmm. So if we could organise that, that would be terrific. Yep. Thank you. Oh. You think that great? One, just three questions. Sorry. Um, three. <laughs> all right, two and a half. Cox's Quaif Basin looks great. No problem. Uh, and this is sort of mainly directed to Helen and or Ross, who's not here. Why does Ross have to put fences around his ponds when these ones are beautiful and lovely? That's with... a very good question, and I will follow that up. <laughs> yep. Good Thank question. you. Um, with a view to not having to do the other yes, ones, exactly. not, not putting fences around e these ones. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want fences. There'd be a lot of fences in Christchurch. There would be. Every, um, every wetland, no, no, we every don't, drain. Don't want, uh, no, we do, not, we do not want fences. Because it, there'd be a bugger to work around them and mow grass and all sorts of things. But yes, I will follow yeah. that. Yeah, and, and one of the... And down in Preston's that you said, there's one pond in particular which the, the uh, locals are getting quite aggravated with. One of them... Only one of them has got duckweed in it, and they can't seem to get rid of it. If you could look at seeing how we could get that out, you'll see it. It's yeah, um, it's generally harmless, I think, isn't it? Yeah, but it covers the whole mm. lake. But it's the only one in there. Yeah, so funny thing. So Preston's, when they originally proposed their stormwater facilities, they were they were hell bent on getting uh, wet ponds. They wanted ponds that were wet all the time, mm -hmm. and um, the council opposed that. We prefer dry ponds because they're easy to, easier to maintain. Mm -hmm. We don't have to cut aquatic weed from them, and we don't have issues like algae and duckweed and so on and so forth. But we lost that battle, so unfortunately, um, we're stuck with the maintenance. And the other half question? Uh, the other half question. Oh, are you going to put a pond in Hagley Park? No, not a pond. <laughs> um, what we're looking at is potentially a combination of um, redirection to sewer and then what's called uh, filtera or... Um, uh, What's the other name for it? Bioscape, which you is. Your brain there and it's I don't. I know. Oh, yeah. 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 It's just dealing. No. With no. It just seems strange to me that we, we Helen goes around the peninsula and whatever, spending a hell of a lot of money stopping stormwater egress into the sewer, and here we are encouraging it in. So it's all about <laughs> management of of that, uh, yeah. and to ensure that uh, doing that doesn't impact on our ability to meet our overflow requirements. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no worries. 
Yeah. Um, and it may be that the, the capacity for what stormwater in the sewer is reduced over time as, as more um, demand is, is required. So, But the facilities that we're actually looking at building are um, landscape-based biofiltration. Um, so they would blend in with the landscape of the area. Yep. Thank you. Yanni, just quickly. Yeah, just quickly. Um, are we going to get a report back on the Richardson's, uh, uh, yeah, Richardson Terrace pump, you know, the big stormwater? The Bells Creek yes. filter. Bells yeah. Creek filter, because like, I know that was kind of a, a new project. Yes. It would be really good to understand how it's... Yep, so we've had some difficulties um, getting uh, organized to do the water quality monitoring there as a... Um, uh, it's a collaboration between Stormwater 360, the manufacturer, but also the University of Canterbury, most likely as um, a sort of a, a, a oversight. So we are working on getting them access to set up monitoring equipment so that we can report on performance there. Yes. So we haven't got anything monitoring it at the moment. No, no, not water quality monitoring, but we have been monitoring um, flow and water levels. Um, there's been also some issues with how it's performing in terms of the flow of water coming into the cartridges. We maybe get a closeout report or something around that. I, I don't know what the best process is, to, but you know, it's a lot of money. It's got very expensive op ongoing operational costs. It, yes. And the idea was to put something in that we could trial. So I just think we need to really understand how it's working and lessons or... Getting the data. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean so the, the good news quality. is that that it is capturing lots and lots of sediment um, because we've recently been in there to um, clear out the sediment and replace some of the cartridges, yeah. Yeah. and so there will be a report on that that's okay. available. Yeah. Cool. And then the, I think quick other thing was the lower Heathgate. Really interested in what you're thinking there. Um, there's a lot of industrial subdivision happening, and we were told there was no need for water storage. But then, you know, what's clear from like the rains that we're getting is possibly there there could be so. I don't um, know when we can see. Have you got a proposal for lower Heathcote mitigation, like stormwater? So the basins? stormwater management plan for lower Heathcote, is, well, for all of the Heathcote, but particularly the lower part, which we haven't really looked at yet, um, is in draft form. And I, I think it's... It just seems crazy, like the area, like Tunnel Road, which has got massive flood, you know, it's had massive flooding issues, probably equal, and I think actually the limit lower... For, um, the lower fields through the Limwood paddocks as well. Um, yep. You can see the water just, you know, when it's stormy, massive flooding issues. And we've got a whole bunch of industrial development that people are getting really concerned about because they're raising all the land. And where's all the water going to go? Industrial development, do you mean down in sort of the Heathcote Valley? Yeah, Kennaway Farm. Right, okay. So, area. yeah, Kennaway Farms are so close to um, the coast that it's largely uh, tidal tidally influenced there um they so effectively there's no point in doing storage at that location because it's it's too far down the catchment there is quite a lot of natural flood storage in the Heathcote valley um and it's about managing that existing ponding but that that will be part of the Heathcote stormwater management plan okay okay yep. thanks Oh, just actually just noticing that there's an awful lot of interest and um, information that we'd probably appreciate. So could we have another go at this? You know, I think, it, well, for me personally, I, there's a lot of things I'd like to ask and we don't have time today. Yeah, yeah. If, if you, I mean, I'm happy to, if you have specific areas you, you want to um, ask questions about, I'm happy to answer those offline. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I do feel, I'm um, sorry, it is a bit rushed. We, we wondered about having this as a Tuesday briefing, actually, but... We may be able to slot something in later on on one of the Tuesdays because it is really interesting what we're doing and it's affecting a lot of our wards. But, um, okay, we'll leave that for now. So um, thank you very much for Brian for putting that together. Um, on to your report, Helen. Thanks, Brian. All right. So this is the report for July and August. So we're out, a wee bit out of date and there's quite a lot happened since, um, particularly on the regulatory and legislative side. So you'll all be aware, of course, that the Water Services Act is now in place. And what that, what that means for us, mostly in an operational sense, is that responsibility for uh, incident response compliance and for our water safety plans moves from the Ministry of Health uh, to Tomata Arawai. So that'll happen sometime um, during November. 
and we have had some preliminary discussions with the staff from Tomata Arawai to uh, to get to grips with how that will work. And we've got contact details, for example. So any incidents in our water supply system, we now um, have the contact details for for where those get reported through. Uh, in terms of the water safety plans themselves, we had planned to resubmit the Christchurch water safety plan through to Wycomply. Wycomply have not been accepting water safety plans. They've been focusing on tying up all of their compliance work and on transition to uh, Tomata Arawai as the new regulator. So they're not um, they're not accepting water safety plans from anybody. It's not it's not just us. So that water safety plan for Christchurch now will be submitted through to directly to Tomata Arawai. Uh, sometime in November or later, we're not sure what. One of, one of the reasons we're not sure on the timing is that we are aware that Tamata Arawai have been doing some work on the guidance framework, and we would be quite keen to see that work before we resubmit any of our water safety plans. So we've got a couple that are, um, that are ready to go. Uh, we've also submitted to to Environment Canterbury our annual report on the comprehensive stormwater consent. So that's the, the end result of all of the work that Brian has just briefed you on uh, in terms of the improvements to water quality and to waterways across the district. Uh, we've got our annual compliance report for drinking water and we've also got the compliance report from Environment Canterbury on wastewater overflows and you, you may have some, um, some questions on that. Good progress is also being made on the um, drinking water and sanitary survey needs across the district, and we've um, fast-tracked some work for Port Levy and Kokorarata, um, understanding the priority that the Runanga has put on the um, settlement at, at Kokorarata. So that, that work will, will come to you in time for some sort of consideration during the annual plan. Uh, it's also worth noting that at your November meeting, you will get the bylaws. So we've been doing a lot of work on the water and wastewater bylaws and on the stormwater bylaws. So the, the three waters bylaws are going to be split in two, water and wastewater and then stormwater. And those draft bylaws will come to you in November. So there's, um, there's an enormous amount of work gone in there. And most of that into is aimed at meeting these changed regulatory requirements. So for stormwater, it's the new comprehensive consent. And of course, for um, drinking water, it's the, the new water safety plan and the requirements under that. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, I've, look, I've just got a quick one, Helen. That when, when we've got our significantly upgraded infrastructure, the, the the work that's still to come, like a lot of it's not going to be finished till 2023. Have we um, in our um, asset valuation for the three waters? Have we included what those assets will be when they're finished? and before the reforms come in, or did we put the assets in as they're valued now? Uh, we've, got, we've got both, if you like. So we, we have the assets as they are now, but we can also project forward what the assets will be given the work that we've got set out in the long-term plan. So, so at the moment, we're sort of throwing around $6.9 billion and if um, we, we got to a transfer point in 2024, that number would change. It may change a little bit. It won't. It won't change a great deal, but it may change a little bit. I think um, one of the one of the things that asset value the asset valuation is is mostly around the infrastructure itself. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing, particularly for the water safety plan, is driving improvements in specific parts of that infrastructure. So, um, so for example, the the vast majority of the assets in terms of the water supply network are the pipes. So 80% of the value is in the pipe network. Mm. However, most of the work that we've been doing has been focused on specific identified risks. Um, and some of those are in the pipe network. And we do have a renewals program, of course, to address poor condition pipes. But a lot of it has been in the wellheads. So, for example, we have um, upgraded 99% of the wellheads across the city so that now all of our wellheads, almost all of our wellheads are above ground. Um, with the appropriate check valves in place, and they're also really easy to service. So that yeah, that I think work I'm has been done. More about the reservoir. The next, work. that's and right. The stormwater project. So the, just the next two are the um, the backflow. So backflow was identified as a risk, and that that hasn't been. Um, it, we've always we've always addressed backflow as a risk, but what we've addressed is the very high hazard industrial sites. Yeah. And what we've done now is roll that out to um, the medium hazard. 
and some of those even low hazard industrial sites that where activities could change yeah. and we wouldn't necessarily know about it. So I'm just looking at this report and the investment that's still to come. Yeah, right. so reservoirs so is the next one. That's right. Our, um, asset value will be higher. So yeah, so reservoirs. Um, reservoirs. We've got we've got a new what we call a demonstrably safe criteria for reservoirs, mm-hmm. and they must meet um, certain criteria uh, to to be demonstrably safe, and that's linked to removing residual chlorine out of the system. So if if there's a, a large reservoir that doesn't meet those criteria, then residual chlorine must stay on in that zone. Um, and once the upgrade works are done, uh, then that can be removed. And and I know, um, Councillor Chen, you had a question about why is it taking so long at Denton. Um, <laughs> it's 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 we're we're caught really. So we do our reservoirs work in the winter because that's when we can take the reservoirs offline because the demand for water goes down. However, we haven't managed to get a warm enough period in this last winter to apply one of the sealants that we need to use inside the tank. So that's been the delay there. However, all of the other work's been done, and we're just waiting for some warm weather, and we'll come back and complete that. Uh, based on your sorry, okay, but based on your report, you particular mentioned you would like to have a reassessment at the end of September. Yes. But now, you know, almost uh, is uh, in the middle of the October. So I will not have any update status regarding to your reassessment. It's cold out there so we still have to wait for that weather to warm up and then we can come back and do the last bit of work at Denton. We have begun the work at Sockburn though as well so that work is progressing as the um, as the lockdowns and the weather allows. Okay, thank you. Yana you had a question? I'm just um, trying to trying to get a sense of um, the 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 temporary chlorination, which we're told, has to continue until um, everything's meeting criterion two for bore water security. Um, and you say that Brooklyn's Kayanga was given secure bore status? That's right. So does that mean we... I, I don't know if we have chlorine in that one. No, they don't have chlorine. They, they don't. But if they did, we could have stopped having chlorine in there? Yes, we could have. Um, yeah, that one... That one... Do. That one, the well heads have both got the double sign offs. Right, yeah. which is great. So, how can we can't do that for the other ones that we've fixed or improved? Because they stopped signing them off. Because the drinking water assessor stopped signing off those well heads. Sorry, the, sorry, just so I'm clear, the Brooklyn's Kayanga got signed off. Yeah, before yes. they changed the rules. Before they changed their approach. Yeah. Okay, I, mean, I thought that had just been done recently. The sorry, the um, the security of the of the bore water has been done recently. Yes, yeah. so we have that full secure status. Oh, okay, but the wells were already approved. The wells, the wells well had already been approved. Oh, okay, that's thank correct. You for clarifying. So, do you, in terms of the the point two, um, and that's just on page seventy three, um, where um, the suction tanks and reservoirs supplying greater than five thousand people, blah blah blah, goes on condition grade three or better for hatches seals. What's the expected end date of that work? So we've we've completed all of the external inspections. We've prioritised the reservoirs and we're now working through the internal inspections. And at the same time, some of those works, for example, the ones at Denton and Sockburn are, are already in progress. Um, there's also works underway at Quarry planned for Hackthorn. So it's a rolling programme across the city. I can't I can't give you precise dates, unfortunately. But I just like is it gonna take years? Is it gonna take months? I mean I just can't I'm just sort of struggling to understand given that we've been dealing with this temporary chlorination for it feels like five years, it's probably less than that. But um like we've been doing all this work around water safety plans, inspections, you know, we've had the stuff in Denton. Like is this just something new that got added? It's basically that we have to do more work now because the standards have changed, or is this something that we didn't recognise that we would have to do, or were we struggling to get resources? So the the risk frameworks for the water safety plan were changed and made stricter. So the um, the tolerance for risk in community drinking water supplies has has become very low indeed, and there, and rightly so. And when we when we reassessed our network under that new risk framework. We identified the suction tanks and reservoirs as being unacceptable, in the given the condition that they were in, and that's what's prompted the reinstatement of the 0.2 part per million residual chlorine in some zones, 
and that's prompted the work program. So the inspections, then the scope of works, and then the upgrades. And they'll take place in a, in a rolling manner across the city. And as the works are done, then um, assuming that our water safety plan is, um, is acceptable in terms of tomato arawai, then the chlorine would be removed. So it's not, it's not a, it's not, there's not one end date. It's for each water supply zone as we improve the infrastructure in that zone. But uh, yeah. I just think it's really hard for people to comprehend like when we can take temporary chlorination out. I mean, yes, it it's is. Just it's very we, difficult and it's like, very complex. It just feels like we should just take it out and, and let us be challenged. So right. our, our yeah. own water safety plan identifies um, the wellheads, which are largely done, yeah. the backflow, where we've addressed all of the, the high and medium hazard and we're working through some of the lower um, the lower risk sites at the moment, so that's largely done. Right. Um, and now the suction tanks and reservoirs. So it's our own water safety plan and our own assessment of that risk under the new framework that says it's unacceptable and we need the chlorine. So we scored a known goal. No, we needed to respond to the new framework that the regulator has promulgated. So we can't, we can't, um, surely the thing we like can't a, ignore that new framework. Surely with a, like a water safety plan, that's like a continuous improvement thing yes. where you identify the risks and you work towards them. Yes. So, you know, I don't know. It's just in, incredibly frustrating. Um, and the whole idea that we can't even resubmit our water safety plan. So basically, even if we could resubmit it, it would make no difference because we haven't done the work. No, 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 that's not, no, that's not so. So um, the water safety plan, um, we've had water safety plans approved in the past with unacceptable risks where we're managing that risk. And so we, what we generally do is we have additional, uh, additional processes for risk management in place in the short term, and then we are working on a longer term fix, as you say, in terms of that right. continuous improvement. And um, the temporary chlorine, is one of those short-term risk management things that we've got in place in the city. So we can submit. And in the longer term, we're doing the um, either remediation or replacement of those reservoirs and suction tanks. Do, is there any way to explain to the community which of those suction tanks and reservoirs, like if we had our water safety plan approved, would be up to that standard? Like, you know how we've got the map that we used to show all the wells and the... Yes, we could do that. Yes, and we could. Yes, we definitely could do that. Yeah. Okay. So um, um, at, at the moment, I've um, so we've got we've got a team working on reservoirs and suction tanks, and we've now we've now been through a number of inspections and a number of internal follow up inspections and a number of scopes of work and some remedial works. Okay. And what I've asked them to do is just do a stock take and a review of where we're at and a reassessment of that demonstrably safe criteria to ensure that it's fit for purpose. Yep. And what I mean is that it is both strict enough and not overly strict in all of the, um, all of the aspects of it. Okay. So it's quite a comprehensive checklist that we're using, and we are just re-evaluating that. And then, um, then we'll, we'll go out and, if necessary, reassess those reservoirs. Right. And the good news is that we've got most of the age, 95% of the age modelling done the bad news is we now have to get it peer reviewed yes we see, that's right so most of the um well all of the samples have been taken most of the results are back in and now it's the modeling of the groundwater and getting the peer review of the model and then it's uh then it's that's given to the drinking water assessment. 2023 sometime we don't know the date 2022 2022 2022 it was going to be this year um leanne have you got questions? sorry just just one final question um separate from the the whole chlorine but there was a, um, we were told that ECAN had served as a compliance monitoring report on the stormwater going into, I think, the Heathcote of Hawaii. Um Sorry, I just, lots of pages, I can't find the exact um, Is that thing. the non-conformance? It was a compliance monitoring report for a, um, I presume it's a non-compliance under the um, stormwater discharge consent. Um, Page 66 yes. maybe? For sediment? I, I, sorry, I'm just trying to. I can come back to you on that one if you like. It's just like, could we get like a memo about what's actually happened? Um, I mean, I'm just still concerned, you know, that we do have a lot of sediment runoff into the Heathcote and, you know, we've obviously done the LTP where we, we didn't put, I mean, we put a little bit extra on, but not the amount that staff said we needed for improving water quality. So I guess I was just wondering if there's going to be any requirement to spend additional resources or funds to get better compliance with, with that. 
so we do we do have the extensive stormwater basins and um, and wetlands in the Upper Heathcote catchment, and we also have that additional work on the Kashmir stream, and those will help. Uh, we've also got additional funds on budget in the long term plan for planting across the Port Hills, and it's that planting across the Port Hills that's absolutely critical to getting a change in terms of that sediment runoff. Right. So when we get these massive rainstorms. There's an enormous amount of sediment that comes into the Heathcote, regardless of our own systems. Yeah. Uh, so we, that that is one of the one of but, the critical areas. But there's also a whole bunch of work happening around building sites and non-compliance. And yes, you know, and sometimes not yeah, and sediment. sometimes we have had a non-compliance from a building site where we've had runoff. However, when you do the monitoring of the stream, you can't actually tell because there's so much sediment coming from the Port Hills and I. I, I hesitate to say from the natural environment because that farmed environment on the Port Hills is anything but natural, uh, and that's why that that vegetation, revegetation of those Port Hills is critical to that. Do you have a question? Did you have a question? Yep. yep. Last question. Sorry. Um, I just want to kind of run through the the, the change to the legislation so that um, just just to understand it quite clearly. Do you want to come up, Diane? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that the the frustration that Yani's expressing is one that's felt, you know, broadly in the community because people want to see an end date to the to the chlorine, but the rules have changed, and so, um, and now the in, in many respects the, the 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 bar is changing, but we don't know when the end point is. So so let me understand because the new legislation's come in. It doesn't have a start date for the regulatory frameworks, and it does indicate that there may be different start dates for different parts of the legislation. So, the framework for um, submitting to uh, Tamata Arawai the new water safety plan uh, for review by them uh, that that we won't know the date of that until there's an order in council bringing that part into effect. Is that right? That's correct, although on their website they say they expect that to be sometime in November. Yeah, so it'd be probably the middle of November now rather than the beginning of November as people were expecting. And then it, the, the, the follow-on from that is, is that do, do the do, our criteria that we based the removal of the chlorine on given that those criteria don't now apply, are we, I mean, what, 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 how would we take any of the chlorine out after, um, before the exemption process is put in place? So, so Tomata Arawai, well, while they're not um, formally the regulator at the moment, they do have a lot of very good information on their website. And one of the things that they say very clearly is that the water safety plan is the foundational document for managing risk in community water supplies and will continue to be so. Right. So that's a clear indication that it is the water safety plan um, that is critical to the way we manage our, our network. And in our water safety plan, we use chlorine in a temporary and targeted manner, yep. not as a permanent residual disinfectant. And that um, temporary and targeted manner is is demonstrated today, and and as we do work, um, the chlorine is either removed or reduced across the network in accordance with that water safety plan. Right. The 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 tricky thing for us at the moment is that we are um, we are managing the network largely in accordance with our revised water safety plan because that's the best risk management document we've got and the best assurance of water quality for the general public. However. Our approved water safety plan, our old water safety plan, remains the um, the statutory document. So we we sort of have to comply with both of them, <laughs> and that and that does cause us some um, exactly the issues that that Councillor Johansson raised around not being able to remove chlorine even when all of the work has been done within a particular water supply zone and because that's we because don't have the drinking that, water assessor that double signing off. off the well. Yes, beds. yes. So that's why getting the new water safety plan. Um, formally in place is critical yeah. to moving forwards. And what does that, what does that, because we won't know until the, um, 
exemption provisions come into play. So you'd want the water safety plan um, go through the process uh, first before we would apply for an exemption. Yes. Yeah. And I would see an acceptable water safety plan as um, the, the first requirement anyway for any exemption process. Right. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, is that I guess some people were sort of saying, well, what, what, why have we done all this work on bringing the wellheads up to scratch and everything like that um, when we still haven't got to chlorine-free status? Um, and I kind of been saying, well, the rules have changed and each time we have stepped up the approach in order to address those. But can you just comment on the approach that we adopted on, on lifting the wellheads and how that might relate to what's happening in other parts of the country now? Yeah, the, the, trigger, for, the trigger for lifting the wellheads was really the Havelock North inquiry. So in, in Havelock North, the, um, the contamination event was either uh, directly into the aquifer, because it wasn't a fully confined aquifer, as, as ours are, or via a below-ground wellhead where contaminated water could get into the, um, the chamber where the wellhead was sitting and then get into, into the water supply network that way. So um, that did trigger the, um, the review of wellheads across the country and, of course, triggered a number of engineers to stop signing off as secure Below ground wellheads that they had previously signed off every year. That they had previously signed correct. off every year. That's correct. <laughs> so, um, so people took a much stricter approach to the interpretation of the standard for wellheads. Plus uh, a little bit of had. risk aversion, perhaps. Changed there was quite the a bit of risk aversion involved in there, and and as I say, <laughs> that's that's um, that's it, probably it? appropriate for a community water supply. Uh, to be to be risk averse in your in your approach, so uh, we have uh, we did fast track the raising of our wellheads, and that has been a um, a program that's been delivered in a short period of sort of three to five years for most of them, rather than over a thirty year period as we would normally have as they came up for renewal um, in the infrastructure in the infrastructure planning. Uh, so. So yes, we're a long way ahead of a lot of other places in that we've got most of our wellheads raised and they are now best practice above ground wellheads. They're um, also much easier to maintain and we don't have the health and safety issues we had in the past of people going into these below ground chambers. So that's also been a good thing. And we are raising the wellheads across on Banks Peninsula. Uh, and we've shared our plans with um, other local authorities around the country so that they can, yes, we do. They can right. raise theirs as well. And that, that is happening across the and country. And that is happening around the country now. Yes. So we, we've been a step ahead because of the um, approach that we've taken. Yeah. Yes. Certainly, and we're very confident in the security of the source yeah. and in the extraction of water from that source. And now the focus has moved to the network with the um, focus on backflow and the focus on the uh, suction tanks and reservoirs across the network. Your, your point about it being rightly so in terms of the, the approach to risk um, I think that's quite important, and um, I think it's important that the public understand as well, because the the, the consequences of um, a contamination event in Christchurch because of its scale would be catastrophic. Except that this multi-barrier approach is is the way that that we've managed that risk um, without the use of residual chlorine, but but as you say, targeted. Um, how do we how do we get? Um, I'm, I'm I'm just trying to see if we can help uh, an understanding of 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 you know the the kind of the sequence of events that that would take place now. But we, we've got our water supply now carved off into different areas and that zones. Zones, yes. So um, we yeah we deliver the water through a number of water supply zones, which are an accident of history really, so because they're from the old councils that amalgamated to form Christchurch. However, we we are we are actively um, looking at those zones and have a rezoning project as well. So for example, we've um, we've cut off the Rafiti zone, yeah. so out on the east side of town, so that that's a um, an independent zone and we can manage it separately. We, we also do have connections between the zones so that we can open those if we um, if we were required to in an emergency. If we, lo if we lost a couple of pump stations, for example, we can open up between the zones and connect across. 
but yes, those those separate water supply zones are um, another part of managing the network and managing the risk in the network mm -hmm. because the um, the water doesn't generally cross from one zone to another. And if that's the case, then that means that if there were um, a, a contamination event of, of substance that it, it, you, it would be confined to the zone. Yes, it's confined to yeah. the zone, yeah. yes. So okay. it's all part of a whole risk management approach. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, we're just out of time. So um, thanks, Helen, very much. Another really good report. Um, I'd like to... Oh, I've, just, I've just added another resolution there that the committee requested memo from staff on the Bells Creek filter performance and data collected to date. So I'd like to move the report and the additional resolution. Do we have a seconder? Jimmy? Oh, have you got a... No, any debate? Yani? Do you think we should be also writing to the Minister raising concern that why comply are no longer taking water safety plans? I mean, I, I just find it so frustrating that we, in good faith, try to enter into these um, relationships and now we've got, you know, a private company who's the, being contracted in to be the regulator doing the assessment and we can't even get our water safety plan looked at. It, it just seems a joke, actually, can, given how much time and money and resource we've put in as a council to be treated in this way. And I think we should be elevating it and expressing to the government in no uncertain terms that we're incredibly pissed off at what's going on. It is totally unfair on our residents to have to put up with this nonsense. I wonder if I could just clarify. Oh, no, sorry, we're in, in debate. Sorry, we're just winding up, Ellen. Yeah. Um, debates? Um, I'd like to use this debate as an opportunity to thank our three water staff for the extraordinary amount of work that they've done over the last few weeks. Um, the pressure that has gone on in terms of um, meeting the compliance requirements of, of providing feedback to central government on the Three Waters Reforms Program, um, in addition to all of the work that is ongoing in uh, drinking water, um, uh, wastewater and uh, stormwater, which we've had presented today, it just shows how lucky we are to have such an extraordinary team. And I'd like that be the message that go back to the organisation. Um, in terms of the change in the uh, environment, the new regulator is in, is in effect. The new law will apply to the new regulator within a matter of weeks. And whether we had referred a water safety plan uh, to Y comply, which um, would have been probably this month, to delay it by a matter of weeks in order to see how the new organisation will offer its guidance uh, before submitting, I think makes absolute sense. And I'm very happy with the way the staff have responded to the um, rapidly changing regulatory environment. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Sarah? Uh, sorry, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I would hate for a um, debate to, um, that potentially, or some comments that were potentially based on a misunderstanding of information from staff to be reported in the media in such a way. And it's your, um, you have the opportunity as chair to ask for additional information from staff during the debate if that's deemed appropriate. And I'm just wondering if you could allow Helen to um, answer that point so that it's not potentially reported incorrectly. I'm happy for that to happen. Yeah. Thank you. Apologies if I've misunderstood what was going on. Yes, you have. Thanks, Helen. All right, sorry, I'm, I, I probably should have been clearer and we were a bit short on time, but um, it's, it's not that Y-Comply have refused to assess the water safety plan. We've been working very well with Y-Comply and they have been extraordinary to work with in terms of the audit and assessment of our water safety plans. However, they have, um, they have had to focus on their compliance role uh, which they also undertake for the Ministry of Health, and also on transition from the um, Ministry of Health to Tomata Arawai. And they simply haven't had the capacity to assess water safety plans during that transition. So it's not, it's not that they've refused or been uncooperative in any way at all. In fact, they have been, um, they have been very open and frank with us in terms of the work that they have to do. Yeah, thanks so. for rectifying that. And, I, and, I look, and I'll just quickly wind it up Loads by saying that I can fully understand Councillor Johansson's uh, frustration and passion over this. We've all been frustrated for a couple of years now because 
information is being drip fed to us, the goalposts have been moving all around all the time. Um, we've stepped up and proactively um, lifted our game and, our, and, and brought forward our projects in our Three Waters programme, not just drinking water. Um, and we're doing everything right. I think Christchurch is an exemplar. And at the same time, as Leanne's pointed out, staff have been battling with providing all this information to the Crown and answering questions and complying, uh, compiling massive, massive reports. So I, I endorse everything Leanne said, and I'm sure everyone around this table does too, that congratulate you for all the work that you're doing and the incredible level of skill and knowledge and experience that we have in this organisation. And to me, it would be the saddest time to have that broken up and, and reinvent the wheel. So um, I understand fully where you came from there, Yanni. All right, on that note, I will move the motion. Do I have a seconder? Done that. Have I done it? Yeah. OK, I will put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. That's carried. Thank you. <coughs> Two minutes over. Sorry for the rush, guys. We've just... We should come here. Oh, okay, um, at the end, yep. close the meeting. Kia ora te marino. Kia whakapapa. Kau namo te, te moana. Hei huarahi. May peace be widespread, may the sea be like greenstone. A pathway for us all this day. Find us together. Kia ora. Thank you, Anne. Cheers.